It's kind of strange to be discussing strategy when we're in the fifth year of a conflict. Um, but this is coming up in large part because the last six to nine months have seen a fundamental shift in the Syrian conflict with the rise of ISIS that drew the US in. We'd been resisting getting involved for a very long time. The White House finally decided that they would get involved in September. Um, and since then, we've been spending about $10 million a day bombing ISIS. Um, this campaign has had some successes, depending on how you define success. Um, we killed about 6,000 Syrian rebels, uh, sorry, not Syrian rebels, ISIS members, um, maybe as many as 8,500. That's about 20 to 30% of ISIS total strength. Um, but how useful this has been is very questionable. Um, so with a few key exceptions, we've really not taken out much of the ISIS leadership. Um, and ISIS appears to be so effective in their PR strategy and recruitment that some sources estimate that ISIS is recruiting people fast enough to offset their losses from the bombing campaign. We may not be making much of, of an impact at all. Um, but more interesting from the point of view of this panel's topic is the fact that almost all of these gains have been in Iraq, not in Syria. Only about a quarter of the casualties that ISIS has suffered have been in Syria. Um, ISIS has suffered almost no territorial losses um, inside Syria. Um, and while we have partners on the ground in Iraq that are helping and that's encouraging some successes there, we don't have that kind of situation in Syria. So while we're seeing some degradation of ISIS within Iraq, the same is not true of Syria. Um, and the major problem, as Erika outlined, is that this is a two-front war. There is the war against ISIS, and then there is the Syrian civil war in which the rebels are trying to overthrow Bashar al-Assad. Um, and just in general, um, I think it wouldn't be overkill to say that the Syrian civil war is just a complete mess. There are hundreds of discrete rebel groups. Alliances shift from week to week. If you were to draw a chart of rebel group alliances today, it would probably be out of date by next week, two weeks from now. So this is the environment in which the US is trying to forge some kind of viable strategy to combat ISIS. Um, current US policy or the current US approach, which includes bombing ISIS and the arming and training of a selection of Syrian rebel groups, ostensibly with the goal of them fighting ISIS, is largely inadequate to solve our strategic goals here, which is the degradation of ISIS, not necessarily the overthrow of the Assad regime. Um, and so our strategy is inadequate for a couple of reasons, and I'd like to go into a little depth um, on these. So the biggest problem in Syria is our allies. Um, chief among them, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, other Gulf states, and to a lesser extent, Turkey. Um, these allies very much contributed to the mess that is Syria today. Um, in their desire to overthrow the Assad regime, some might say desperation to overthrow the Assad regime, um, they sort of indiscriminately funded and armed lots of different rebel groups. Um, sometimes this was purposeful. Qatar has actually funded groups like Jabhat al-Nusra that's pretty extremist. Um, a lot of the times it was very um, unintentional. So these countries funneled arms, they funneled money into Syria. It went to groups that weren't necessarily um, the people they thought they were funding. We ended up with a lot of extremist groups getting arms and those have very much come to the fore in this conflict. This has also been encouraged by the fact that our allies, particularly Saudi Arabia, um, very much funded this in a sectarian way. Um, so they focused on Sunni groups, they focused on groups with Islamist ties. Um, and while that might not necessarily seem like the end of the world, what it did in Syria was reinforce the Assad regime's narrative that this was a sectarian conflict. And it's created kind of a rump state of Syrian loyalists who are loyal to the Assad regime because they're minorities and in large part because they fear what will come after Assad. So the Druze, the Alawites that are still in government controlled regions in Syria, they're obviously terrified of what would happen if ISIS takes over. But they're probably scared of what would happen if a more moderate Islamist group would take over too. The situation does not look good for them. This is part of why the regime maintains some support in the regions it controls. Um, in addition to the sectarian problem, our allies also worked against one another on the ground. This is a problem that's been going on for the last four years. Um, so Qatar, uh, in particular, and Turkey funded groups associated with the Muslim Brotherhood, but the Saudis refused to work with groups that are associated with the Muslim Brotherhood. The Saudis preferred groups with Salafi ties, 
which Qatar wasn't too happy about, a lot of the times these groups actually ended up fighting one another rather than fighting the regime. And this has contributed to the general fragmentation of the Syrian opposition, its general move towards extremism, and the fact that at this point it's very unclear who is fighting who, who is allied with who, and if there is anyone that we could rely upon to be what the White House calls moderate Syrian rebels. Um, so our Middle Eastern allies have succeeded more recently in sort of de-conflicting their approach within Syria. Um, but even with this, their policies still conflict with US goals, a fact that Erica touched on. So these states see the overthrow of the Assad regime as non-negotiable. It is their top priority, not the fight against ISIS. Um, and a lot of the recent rebel gains that we've seen have come from coordination between these states. So Qatar, Saudi Arabia, and Turkey have coordinated on a new alliance, uh, Jaish al-Fateh, or the Army of Conquest. That group has made a lot of progress um, in fighting the regime, particularly in Idlib province. The problem is, it's an extremist group. It's made up of about half more moderate Islamist groups and half groups like Ahrar al-Sham or Jabhat al-Nusra, which is a known al-Qaeda affiliate. So even though these groups that are being funded are fighting the Assad regime, they are not people that we really want to end up in charge of Syria. Um, and so I would say the influence of our Middle Eastern allies on the conflict in Syria is in large part undermining our ability to formulate a viable strategy in the region. There are obviously other problems with US strategy towards Syria. Um, and I honestly hesitate to call it strategy because it is really not that well developed. Um, so the US has primarily focusing on ISIS. We really haven't taken a stance on the Assad regime. Every time it seems like somebody in the White House or the Pentagon or the State Department takes a more firm stance for or against the Assad regime, somebody else walks it back. And that has happened half a dozen times. Um, U.S. strategy is largely dependent, um, as Erica noted, on bombing raids, on the use of targeted air power. Um, but the problem is that without an on-the-ground presence in Syria, those are only going to be so useful. Um, and there really isn't a viable on-the-ground resource for the U.S. to call on. Um, we appear to have abandoned or lost a, a number of the groups that were involved in the earlier CIA arm and train efforts that started in 2013. The biggest of those groups, Harakat al-Hazm, was basically disbanded in March. That was about 4,000 fighters. They suffered a lot of uh, territorial losses, mostly to al-Nusra, and they eventually disbanded. Many of their fighters have gone on to other groups. That was the core of the initial CIA arm and train efforts. Um, the major rebel groupings that remain in Syria actually have very little in the way of working relationship with the US or even with other Western countries. Um, the Free Syrian Army that used to be the face of the Syrian rebellion are now much diminished in power, is really doubtful if they actually represent anybody on the ground within Syria. Um, and the main groups are Islamist groups, some of which, particularly the new Army of Conquest, are quite extreme. Um, the new recruit and train effort that's being pushed by the military, the US military, is aiming to recruit about 5,400 Syrians a year um, in order to fight ISIS. Um, and they're having some recruitment problems with that. For starters, they're having to mostly recruit from outside Syria because inside Syria they can't easily tell whether people have extremist ties or not. Um, but even once they're recruited and even once they're trained, we don't know who they're going to fight. The US wants this group to fight ISIS, but most of the rebels involved in the training program want to fight the Assad regime. And it's anybody's guess if once they're trained, they will actually fight who we want them to fight. So this is a, a major flaw in the current US strategy towards Syria. Um, and ultimately, the airstrikes that we're undertaking and the training programs, all of these things risk pulling the US deeper into a conflict. So. The US clearly needs to rethink its approach to the Syrian conflict. Um, and I would argue that what we really ought to focus our efforts on is we ought to turn back to diplomacy, seeking some kind of a negotiated, transmission, negotiated transition. That we need to deal with the problem of the Assad regime before we can turn towards degrading or destroying ISIS. Not militarily, but diplomatically. 
So the solution that has been proposed by our allies to solve the Syrian problem is that we arm and support the rebels, create a safe zone in the north of the country, support that with US and coalition air power, train rebels in that area, send them to overthrow the Assad regime. And once that's completed, then we turn towards ISIS. Um, but there's a number of problems with that approach. One is that it would draw the US further into the conflict. And it's a conflict that actually has little bearing on US interests. There's major technical difficulties, as I've discussed, as Eric has discussed. The fact is that many of these groups just aren't going to be good to work with. They're not people we necessarily want to be working with. Um, and the biggest problem is that overthrowing the Assad regime will take a long time. Although there's been some recent noises that the regime is weakening, they're still pretty strong in Damascus in the south. Um, they're not going to be overthrown easily. And it's going to take a long time to do it. So the only viable approach that we can take is diplomacy. Um, and this is something that the US really hasn't talked about in the last year or more. Um, diplomacy has barely been attempted since the failure of the Geneva Two Talks. That was at the start of last year. Um, there's been some talk of a new UN initiative to try and push for peace in Syria, but it's not really getting off the ground and it doesn't have a lot of support in Washington. Um, so negotiations previously had failed because the Assad regime wouldn't countenance any loss of power, the rebels won't accept Assad in power for obvious reasons. Um, so Assad, as the State Department has said, still probably has to go. Um, he's been far too brittle to his people. He has committed war crimes. He is not a viable person to engage in a transition process with. But that doesn't mean that the broader Assad regime, loyalists within that region of Syria, cannot be involved in a negotiated peace process. Um, and there's two particular factors, um, I'll wrap up here in just a second, there's two particular factors that could help push for a negotiated transition in Syria. First, as I mentioned, US allies are a big part of the problem. They could be a part of the solution if the US is willing to put more pressure on them to in turn pressure their proxies to come to the negotiating table. This is an element that's been almost entirely absent in negotiations to this point. And secondly, much will depend on the willingness of the Assad regime's few remaining allies, effectively Iran and Russia, to pressure him to step aside in order to achieve a negotiated transition. Um, and there's some evidence that both states would like to see this conflict come to a conclusion. The Russians are very concerned about the rise of ISIS. They're concerned about uh, Islamic terrorism. And this is a, a key problem for them. Iran sees this conflict, they've been very supportive of the Assad regime, is getting more and more expensive to them. A negotiated transition that allowed them to retain some influence in Syria, but perhaps got rid of Assad, might again meet with some approval in Tehran. The problem is, to have this negotiation, they need to come to the table. That's something that's been entirely absent in past negotiations. Um, so I would say that bringing these states and our Middle Eastern allies on board could provide the needed catalyst for a negotiated transition and provide the US with an opening to achieve its limited military goals as regards ISIS before withdrawing from the conflict. Ultimately, it would have been better if we had stayed out of this conflict. Um, getting involved was probably a big mistake. But now that we're in, we have to think strategically about how we might achieve our limited goals without getting bogged down in another lengthy Middle Eastern conflict.